The Seeds of an Empire, equals RK equals, part 7, equals RK equals, winning the highest ranked officers on Coruscant for the future empire was deceptively simple. There had been growing discontent and rift between the Republic's armed forces and the various civilian governments of the member states. The surviving high-ranking officers of that era are surprisingly thigh-lipped about their meeting with Generals Vale and Kenobi hours before the Coruscant summit began in earnest. What we can conclude, however, was that whatever happened during said meeting had a profound effect upon said officers. It would be generations before the Empire enjoyed as fanatical a number of supporters within the highest echelons of the military as the officers who built it forged it during the fires of the Clone Wars. Rise of an Empire the Coruscant Summit. Equals RK equals. Strategic Planning Amphitheater. Coruscant. There was a lot of history seeped into the walls of this place and today, Admiral Coburn felt felt that history would be made within its halls again. He wasn't alone in thinking that Kenobi and him and his fellow officers to refine the strategy of the long-expected operation to liberate the Corps. However, when he arrived and learned of the Supreme Commander's further orders, the admiral had to rethink his initial impression. Every capable general and admiral on Coruscant were gathered in this room with their executive commanders left to tend the shop, including keeping the whole system safe. And they had to leave their staff and aides outside. Once they entered the meeting room, they began to congregate in small groups clearly showing the various factions within the military. A lot of idle speculation followed, then it was replaced about discussion about the events on Kuat and the political storm they caused. Soon, Kenobi finally arrived and he wasn't alone, Vale walked right beside him and both wore armor. At least the Supreme Commanders was in the distinct gar pattern and colors, while their resident Sith was in full Mandalorian regalia. At ease. Take your seats. We have some grave issues to discuss. They obey almost instantly eager to learn what this was all about. Coburn found himself sitting beside General Zelga, a Duro who still regretted being on Coruscant when his homeworld fell and thus unable to participate in its defense. Ever since then, a manic energy possessed Zelga, and he buried himself in work determined to do his best and then some more to help drive away the enemy. Not too far away, the Admiral could see Valentra sitting beside one of his protégés and vividly discussing something, probably logistics related. If it wasn't fought that man and the superhuman efforts of his staff keeping supplies flowing no matter what, the gar would have been lost a long time ago. Moments later a hush fell upon the large room. Obi-Wan was on the raised platform where for thousands of years officers had delivered briefings and speeches during the era of the Old Republic. He looked over everyone and met their eyes before finally speaking. We are all military men and women. We know the value of facing harsh truths and acting accordingly. I won't lie to you. Kenobi's voice rang true and held infinite sadness. Today we need to face another such truth. The republic we fought, bled and suffered for, the republic that many of our friends and comrades died to protect, is dead. After that declaration, the whole auditorium became utterly silent. Only harsh breathing could be heard. Coburn wanted to say that Kenobi was lying and his heart demanded he protests. Yet, his mind, it knew how true those words were. The mere necessity for Satine Kenobi to become a chancellor the way she did. That day cracked his trust with the Republic and the consequent actions of the Senate and many local governments managed to shatter it. The tragedy of it was that Kenobi's words were anything but a surprise. Coburn wanted to deny them, yet he simply couldn't. He wasn't blind and as the man currently in charge of all naval forces in the whole system, it was necessary for him to keep monitoring the political pulse of the galactic capital. What he saw with his eyes and heard with his own ears didn't fill him with confidence for the future. It was even worse what his colleagues and contacts in the government confided in him. The systems of the Corps were divided like never before. The Navy had to watch like hawk hundreds of them when they needed their strength to liberate the rest of the Corps. The situation had been untenable for some time and the Republic faced a defeat not on the distant front lines but right here, at home. Murmurs broke out, a few exclamations of denial, dull agreements and quiet curses. The Republic didn't die in the flames of war. 
It wasn't the separatists who brought it low, though they tried their damned best. That much we could prevent in spite of the impossible odds stacked against us. That much was true and something all of them felt a pang of pride into. It wasn't even the Jedi coup and the betrayal of our own intelligence services that brought it so low. No, the Republic died right here, on Coruscant, within the hallowed walls of the Senate itself. It died because of the petty squabbles of petulant children masking as our own governments. Coburn's heart stilled. Kenobi couldn't be that desperate or insane even with if Vale lost it. Surely not. He wasn't the only one who stared with wonder, horror or even hungry gleam at the Supreme Commander. Obi-Wan smiled softly and raised a hand. Don't worry, I haven't taken leave of my senses. I'm not proposing something so insane as a coup, that was both relief and oddly. Disappointment? At that moment Coburn found out that if Kenobi actually had proposed a coup, he wouldn't have immediately opposed the very idea and that was something that would have been unthinkable not so long ago. For too long the Gar and Republic Navy had to fight with insufficient support while most of the system defense navies in the Corps sat on their assess hoping someone else would do the bleeding and dying, a reason enough to resent them and the politicians who held them back. Soon there will be a meeting between the government of our defunct Republic and representatives from the major powers of the Corps. The true agenda of this summit will be simple, how to put the pieces back together so we can continue to prosecute this war to a favorable outcome. Kenobi nodded at Vale who took a step forward. Let it be no mistake, we were betrayed. While we all fought, our esteemed politicians plotted how to profit from our misery. Our Kwati friends were merely the most blatant of that lot. I know that for a fact. The Mid-Rim Alliance I had to help build so our forces at and around Naboo would receive sufficient support came together not for the Republic, nor its military but for a number of selfish reasons. The same is true for Kuat, al Zakan, and many more of the people will be meeting tonight. Vale nodded at Kenobi. Those people have no more interest in preserving the Republic. For days now our Chancellor has been bombarded with demands or even orders that she could not possibly fulfill and the price of failure would be the withdrawn of support for the war effort if not a pull out of the Republic itself. Vale sounded genuinely angry and offended. Many sullen looks met his thunderous eyes and dark muttering permeated the auditorium. Everything he was saying sounded all too plausible to be dismissed out of hand and Coburn was pretty sure that Vale wouldn't be making such accusation if he lacked at least some evidence to back them with. The most simple answer was that he had recorded at least some of those meetings and while that was useful, it wasn't the kind of thing he would dare make public because the resulting political firestorm would be disastrous. It was just that, the alternative wasn't any better. Still, neither Vale, nor Kenobi were here just to bring bad news, they had a plan or at least he hoped they did. Today, we all have a choice to make. The two of us, another nod towards Kenobi followed, as well as the Chancellor, made our own. It's not a good one, mind you, however it is the one way we see that might allow us to bring a successful end to the war and restore peace and stability to this ravaged galaxy. What we're here to ask you is to make your own choices. Tonight, We'll have to make a deal with the devil, such a tittle certainly suited a lot of politicians Coburn had the misfortune of knowing. Tonight, in exchange of the support we need to continue prosecuting the war we'll have to build the foundations of a new order, on where the same governments and politicians who betrayed us would enjoy unprecedented power. They will seek to turn the Chancellor into a figurehead and us into their attack dogs who would ensure their prosperity once the dust settles. In time, they will ask us all to betray our oath, our people and their sacrifices in this war. Vales was furious at the very idea. Coburn was too because he suspected where this was going and if he was right, the just the thought of it left sour taste in his mouth. Tonight, we will be be given an ultimatum. We will have to bend and be accomplices in fostering an order where a handful of powerful core governments and corporate entities would call the shots and in the fullness of time they would dispense with even the pretense of democracy. Not that it worked anyway. Someone muttered just loud enough to be heard. In doing so, they would graciously allow us to receive the support we need to win. What we will ask you is not to betray the oaths we've all given. 
We don't merely serve the republic, or its idea. We serve our people. We fight. We bleed. We die to keep our families safe. And if we fail? We avenge them and do our damned best to ensure that no one would suffer again the pain we feel. What we ask you is to help us to turn this abomination that will be forced upon us into something better, a new order we can all be proud of. We ask you to help us usher an era of peace and stability no matter who would profit from continued conflicts. Who stands with us? Well, that was unexpected. The way Vale spoke, the conviction he radiated. In spite of himself, Coburn got on his feet and cheered like a freshly graduated cadet. It's not an easy thing to ask. This burden we will have to shoulder. We all had to make unpalpatable choices, out of necessity. The Republic we swore to protect, we already had to betray it once in order to preserve her citizens. It shouldn't have been necessary for Chancellor Kenobi to gain her position the way she did. Yet every single one of us either backed her decision or at least accepted it because the alternative was to give the galaxy to the separatist. Kenobi grimaced. Tonight we will have to face yet another betrayal. What we spent years fighting against, we will see it when we look in the mirror tomorrow. We have a hard road ahead of us. All we have the right to ask you is to preserve your honor the best you could in the dark days to come, because once we bring the separatists to justice, we have to avoid becoming the enemy we fought in reality no matter what our political lords and masters believe. Equals RK equals. Part 8. Equals RK equals. Chancellor's residence. Senate building. Coruscant. After meeting the highest echelon of the Gar officer corps on Coruscant, Obi-Wan returned to the Senate to prepare for the second and arguably more important meeting for the day. He needed time to bring his spinning thoughts back to order after spending hours in talks with small groups of generals and admirals along with Vale. Their opening speech served them well to crack the door open so to speak and with emotions running high it was easier to plead to their colleagues' sense of duty and integrity. An irrational laughter bubbled in his chest. What did honor matter when they were already traitors if you wanted to follow the letter of the law? They already either supported, accepted or even aided Satine's ascension to power and that despite its broad enough political support was nothing less than a coup. The truth was that many of the officers they spoke with today wanted to be convinced that what they already did and supported was the right thing, that Satine if given a chance and more importantly the tools she needed, could give them what they desired, their homes and families safe, the galaxy brought back to a stable state. As importantly, they promised proper backing for the military in the long run so none of them would find themselves in a situation resembling the current state of affairs again or worse, the opening months of the Clone Wars and this time facing competent enemy. It went well enough, I take it. Palpatine's ghost walked through the door. Obi-Wan's eyes tracked the newcomer like the turrets of a battle-ready warship. This is all your bloody fault. He accused, happy to finally have someone he could vent at. Started the war? Yes, I did. Palpatine smiled sadly. However, there is something important that you and your council overlooked. And what would that be? Obi-Wan bristled at the almost condescending tone the dead man used. What was his game? Was he really trying to justify starting the war? The thought boggled the mind. The war was inevitable. Palpatine delivery rang with complete and utter conviction. Obi-Wan's face twitched. That utter bastard. Inevitable. He scoffed at the obvious lie. Are you seriously trying to pass the blame for? Pass the blame? No. It was Palpatine's turn to exclaim, and he had the gall to sound offended too. State the truth? Yes. Make no mistake, this clone war was inevitable my only is moving up the timetable in an attempt to preserve as much of the galaxy as possible. What? Obi-Wan all but roared. Palpatine dared claim this wasn't all his fault the utter bastard. As furious as he was at the sheer ghoul, words failed the negotiator, I will freely admit, yes, I started the war. Let's there be no mistake about that. I did it. It is my responsibility. What no one asked me was why. Palpatine stared him down. I was the hand moving both sides of the conflict, but that was only because I believed that with my guidance, 
I could manipulate the conflict to a quicker and more expedient end than if the war was allowed to run its natural course. You have seen the casualty reports, you know better than almost anyone else what it means to fight a real galaxy-spanning war. Only Vale, Zash and those other survivors from the Old Republic have a better idea of what that hell truly means. My attempt was to minimize the damage that would be done, but alas, as you can see, my attempt failed. The words themselves sounded so reasonable and logical, yet Obi-Wan knew not to trust the source. He had to remind himself who he was talking with and how dangerous his silver tongue could be. This was the man who deceived the whole Jedi Order for decades. You were trying to create a new Sith Empire. Obi-Wan accused. What Palpatine said might have even held a grain or two of truths, after all the best lies were often based upon half-truths. However, the Sith couldn't have done what he did to help the galaxy. It was all about power, surely. Are you not trying an empire of your own as we speak? Palpatine was ready to point out Obi-Wan's own hypocrisy. He smiled sadly now, like a parent preparing to explain the harsh reality to their child. General Kenobi, the Republic, you've seen it, truly seen it for what it is during these last few months. Deep down within your heart you know the truth, that is what the Republic has always been. And as you yourself and your wife have come to realize, it needed to either change drastically, or be torn down and replaced with something else. I truly believed that I was the only man who could save the galaxy from the fires of war even more destructive than the one you are currently fighting by deliberately keeping both sides of the conflict from going overboard by controlling both sides, it seemed the best option of a bunch of bad ones. Palpatine paused while Obi-Wan digested his words. Denial and resignation warred within the former Jedi. He wanted, needed to deny the Sith's words, yet. There simply was too much truth in them, no matter how the man twisted it to serve his purposes. He simply couldn't dismiss what he heard out of hand. Then Palpatine continued speaking and what he said. I intended to steer both sides of the conflict, centralize power in my office as a chancellor, because the Senate could not, cannot be trusted, and once that was achieved, bring the defeated Confederacy back to the negotiating table so we could hammer out a new order for the galaxy, where the very situation that necessitated my actions could not raise ever again. In order to ensure our security and continued stability, the Republic would be reorganized into the First Galactic Empire, all for a safe and secure society. Is this not what you and your friends intend to do now that you've seen the truth of the Republic? Obi-Wan shook with impotent anger because for all his twisted lies Palpatine was right. What should have been lies in fact, because his words rang true. They mirrored the very reasons why Satine had to become a dictator and now they reluctantly accepted Vale's proposition to form a new order. The only difference he could see between them and Palpatine was that they didn't start the war in the first place that and. That's monstrous. Obi-Wan muttered and he didn't know if he spoke about what Palpatine did and planned to do or about what Vale set in motion and he agreed to support to the bitter end. Necessity often is, Palpatine said gently. Equals RK equals, Senator Skywalker's office, Senate building, Coruscant, Anakin, I told you I will come clean with you about everything once you've truly seen the Republic for what it is, so you can understand firsthand what drove me. Palpatine spoke sadly. To the young Jedi, his old friend sounded almost scared now that he was about to finally explain everything. Do you remember that conversation with your lovely wife you told me about? The one about making people agree with each other? Palpatine asked. I do. Anakin smiled wishfully at how naive he had been. Now he knew better, there was no nice way to make the people running most of the governments in the core, perhaps the whole galaxy do what was best for the Republic as a whole. He hatted that fact, yet how could he deny it when it stared him in the face? Every day he spent as Padme's bodyguard here on Coruscant he learned more and more of how dirty politics were the way so many governments and corporations maneuvered to profit from the war just to earn more bloody credits and power heedless of the suffering and misery their actions or inactions caused. It was sickening, it disgusted him. After everything the separatists did to his Padme, Anakin loathed to admit that at their core, they might be right to want to secede and damn the consequences. Nevertheless, 
he wasn't sure he would be so different in their shoes. During the Naboo crisis my eyes were wide opened about how the Republic really was, Palpatine sighed. Little did I know then that said tragedy was engineered by the man who taught me all I knew about the Force. You see, he was a Sith, he hated the Republic and the Jedi and his kind had been plotting in the shadows for a thousand years. All Anakin could do was stare speechless at his friend and mentor. I felt betrayed, Anakin, both by my master and the Republic I strove to better. So I plotted and got closer to him. I learned all he had to teach, his, the Sith's grand plan, and in my rage and hubris I decided that I could do better. I murdered him in his sleep for what he did to my home. And I then I facilitated the Sith's plan so I could bring low the ineffectual Republic, unite the galaxy and bring back peace, prosperity and security to all. In my hubris, I worked with Plague's other apprentice, my friend Dooku and we created a situation that should have seen the galaxy saved from petty politicians no matter who won. We wanted the worst of them, corporations, warlords, corrupt politicians to burn in the flames of war, for the corrupt republic to shatter and then bring a new order and rekindle the golden age that ended before its time. Yet, I lost my way and Dooku fell to the machinations of the dark side. What should have been a controlled cleansing fire became a full-scale war that even now threatens to doom everything we ever stove to save. Anakin listened in rapt attention and didn't know what to believe. Palpatine sounded so sincere and remorseful that it tore at his heart to hear this confession. The Seeds of an Empire. Equals RK equals. Part 9. Equals RK equals. Only now, that I survived a real galaxy-wide war I know one thing for certain, the opening stages of the Clone Wars were a sham just like we were, both the heroes and villains of those early battles. Even after Vale became supreme commander and we lived through the liberation of Ryloth and following it, second Geonosis, we still lived a lie. There wasn't a single moment of revelation for any of us. As the war progressed our eyes opened slowly but surely. It was the Separatists' grand offensive that gave us a real taste of hell along with the planning that Generals Vale and Valentra did in preparation of it. We had to abandon systems so we can make the enemy bleed when it came to take others, whole sectors in order to hold the line in the core. And even then, as the Corellian system fell and the Five Brothers burned, while whole sector fleets ground each other to stardust across the galaxy, that was merely a taste of the hell to come. Do you know what it takes to assault a friendly world where the enemy has entrenched whole army groups complete with the supplies to last them years? It was even worse on contested worlds where the population was divided and that made a good portion of the mid and outer rim after we had to abandon them. That was one of the best strategic choices we could have done then given the realities we faced. Those actions allowed us to not lose the war during the grand offensive. Yet, at the same time, it was those same choices that helped seal the fate of the Republic and ensured the Senate couldn't, wouldn't work. Shattered dreams, from Geonosis to the end. Equals RK equals. Blue Ballroom. Senate Building. Coruscant. Four of us stood on guard, ready to face the ravenous horde. Satine was to my left, with Obi-Wan in tow just as I had Bowan hanging on my arm and holding for dear life. Who would have thought that my wife would have a fear of such events at least when they weren't out of our more practical and fun Mandalorian stripe? My eyes flickered over the crowd seeking familiar faces. There were over three hundred politicians in here sent to represent the most powerful factions aligned to our cause within the core. At least twice that number local worthies, from high-ranking government and military officials, interpreters, artists, Hollownet celebrities and anything in between gathered tonight to end the Coruscant summit. Anakin was at one side of the crowd escorting Padme, while Zash was on the other on the arm of a Garm Bell Iblis of all people. I could see Valentra with his wife, a bit younger petite Zabrak woman who along with Bo and Satine wore among the few more sensible dresses for tonight's event. Most of said crows was clad with whatever passed for the height of fashion either here on Coruscant or in their corner of the galaxy. They wouldn't be out of place in a familiar imperial function and would have blended splendidly among the gaudiest, most eye-searing and impractical crowds I had the misfortune to navigate in the past. This was it, after tonight, 
Obi-Wan and I would be off to the war and this time Bo would be attached like a limp to my side, while we would leave Satine in this den of wolves with only Zash as occasional company. To be honest, I could still scarcely believe that our schemes came to fruition. First came the meeting with the representatives of the systems that could offer most direct military aid. We did gather them together to meet Kenobi and I, while Satine and Zash, with Palpi and Toe no less entertained many of the other politicians. My mind drifted to the past ten years forty-eight hours just as Satine began her speech. My friends, tonight we're gathered here, burdened with a glorious purpose. Unfortunately, our goals weren't so simple to achieve that a mere mind trick could have done it. Just like when dealing with the Senate, merely persuading these representatives to see things our way would cause more harm than good when the time came for them to sell any deal reached during this summit to their own governments. A few months back, when the Jedi was still a power to be reckoned with on Coruscant, doing something like that would have been an outright suicidal too. Today, the only Jedi on the planet were either on our side, deep underground, running from everyone or incarcerated, awaiting judgment about their involvement with the coup. Obviously, that mere fact untied our hands. I knew that right now a very uncomfortable Obi-Wan, and a peeved-off Sash were in similar conference rooms overseeing meetings with other groups of our friends and allies. I watched fifteen ambassadors, prime ministers and one king take a seat and look at me with ill-disguised fear. Little did they know how right they were in their feelings. Upon this night, we renew our pledge to all citizens of the Republic, Satine continued her rousing speech. She had more than enough natural charisma and experience to make it one for the ages, something helped a lot by the fact that the best PR people on Coruscant helped craft it in the first place. The reforms we agreed upon and I'll bring to the Senate tomorrow will ensure our future prosperity and security. No longer. My will alone shifted the currents of the Force, just like Obi-Wan and Zash as we began our betrayal in earnest, and I could feel their presence as shining beacons. We acted with a singular purpose and our combined power made every force sensitive in the system tremble. When we spoke, we laced our honeyed words with the might of the force itself. We probed and pushed at the minds of our opponents seeking any and all possible edges, we could feel the right words, the correct incentives and the subtle threats that would serve us best. We weren't merely trying to make people see things our way. Instead, we persuaded them to help us convince their governments to support our cause. We asked leading questions, offered suggestions and deals, made demands, even implied wholesale annihilation until representatives and even heads of government worked alongside us to further our agenda all the while they believed they got the better of the deal. Which they often did, in the short term anyway. A union that lasted a thousand years was betrayed and subverted in a manner of months or even days depending on how you counted. I was sure that many Sith of old would break something laughing at the sheer irony of it. Sith had to destroy the Republic to save it from itself. If someone wrote that as a story back in the days of the Empire, no one would have believed it plausible. I continued to examine the crowd. Many watched Satine riveted by her performance, others merely pretended. There were people quietly murmuring to each other too. I felt a sudden jolt of amusement come through my bond with Zash just before she sent me a snippet from her conversation with Garm Bel Iblis. And so here democracy die. Less out of a choice, but of necessity. With your complete backing, dear Senator. Zash purred. She greatly enjoyed this moment as I knew she would. What greater power is there than turning your enemies to your side and way of thinking? What greater victory is there than making them your allies? What other choice do I have? Corellia needs the Republic more than ever. And if we can't get that, the military aid from whoever could provide it. Today, you're the only game in town. His resentment was strong enough to feel it from all the way up here where I stood in front of the crowd. Our betrayal ran deeper. It wasn't just the oaths we gave to the Republic we broke these past few days. Even as we convinced them to aid and back our cause, we betrayed our allies or barring that, sowed the seeds of their future subjugation. Again and again we made conflicting promises, bound ourselves to betray or even break one ally so another could advance and they knew it. There was too much greed, too much bad blood, 
too much power and money to be gained for those willing to invest in our future empire to be any other way. How could be different when during this conference the best of the core and the galaxy took a step back and at best a supporting role? Some of the main leaders and proponents for freedom and democracy in the whole galaxy had to back our scheme either to protect their worlds or help us liberate them. Others did it in a misguided attempt to ensure our empire would be stillborn and destroy itself in the war with the Confederacy so they could be in a perfect position to not only pick up the pieces but ensure our failure would be complete. In another time, 2,000 systems would have backed Mon Mothma and Padme Amidala in a petition for Chancellor Palpatine to step away from power. Those senators, their governments and worlds would have been the beacons of democracy in the Republic. These days, after all that happened to Naboo, not only their people but even Padme Skywalker, Ney Amidala, were reforged by the flames of war. Alderaan and many others reluctantly backed us seeing us as the lesser threat, for the time being anyway. That left idealists like Mon Mothma who were determined to work against us from within from day one. A touch of the force and experience in lip-reading, something I hadn't had to indulge into in a long time and I could see what Padme and her old friend Mothma spoke about. The treacherous senator from Chandrila had a smile on her face that could have fooled everyone, yet among the mostly gleeful crowd her real feelings shone like a beacon. Unacceptable. I will not abide this. Perversion of everything the Republic stood for. Padme, how could you honestly back this insanity? I could practically hear the venom in Mothma's voice. Tread carefully, Mon. Your path is one of treachery. And I will not, cannot support you in this. I saw the records veil brought from Naboo. I read the instructions sent by my queen and people. Did the Republic or Democracy protect my home? Will they ensure Naboo's recovery? Do they have the fleets and armies to send so it won't be attacked again? Anakin went to hug and hold Padme closely. For a casual observer it might even seem that they were overwhelmed and joyful by the momentous occasion. Satine finally completed her speech and the ballroom exploded in thunderous applause. Roaring cheers shook the air itself. This was it. The Republic was dead and we began forging the foundation of an empire upon its still smoldering ashes. Equals RK equals, part 10, equals RK equals, I missed the Coruscant summit and only heard stories of how Generals Vale and Kenobi convinced the highest ranks of Gar High Command to support the future empire. At the time, I was too busy training a large gathering of ships into becoming a proper fleet for what would become known as Operation Star Hammer. Do you know what nowadays I find strange about those first days of the empire, when we didn't even know it would be a thing? How quiet it was. Many of us were too busy to pay much if any attention to the politics at the heart of the Republic and some of our comrades regretted it in the years to come. For us, the Coruscant summit merely ensured we would continue to receive the support we needed for the war and that was enough. We were about to launch the largest Republic offensive since the conflict began and nothing else really mattered in those days. How were we to know that friends and allies alike conspired to reshape the galaxy while we were too busy fighting a war for our very survival? And more importantly, why should have we cared if we knew? They ensured we had what we needed to continue fighting, survive and perhaps even win. Shattered dreams, from Geonosis to the end. Equals RK equals, CIC. Cis Providence class Dreadnought Wars worn. Corellian system. People and droids alike moved all over the compartment like a hive of busy ants, just as they did across an increasing number of Confederate fleets with organic commanders. Admiral Trench and his colleagues did learn the lessons Vale taught them at Sullust and during multiple other encounters after all. Multiple holographic screens hung in front of said Admiral's face, at least one per organic eye he had left. A small distance away from he reports he was busy glancing over floated more and larger screens displaying tactical information from all over the system. Even more data streamed right into his artificial eyes fed by his flag's computers. Trench felt more content than usual, just like a spider waiting patiently and comfortably in the center of its web. Small warship squadrons darted all over the system ready to chase any and all Republic scouting parties. 
A smaller number of larger and significantly more powerful battle groups moved in randomized pattern to ensure no Jedi or Sith-led enemy force could easily surprise them and at the same time be ready for tactical hyperspace insertions in order to box the long-awaited enemy liberation fleet. The backbone of the Confederate defense effort was significantly deeper in the system held safe behind extensive fixed defenses, gravity well generators and minefields. The four more or less secured brothers had whole droid army groups deployed groundside complete with enough supplies to last them years. Those captured Republic words were the sites where the Confederacy built some of the most extensive fortifications outside their own core worlds, both on the ground and in space. While the burden that made it possible further strained the already stretched thin logistics of the CIS, it was going to be worth it. The Republic simply had to secure the core before they could even think about striking anything vital within Confederate space and their time would run sooner, rather than later. If Trench could keep a salient leading to Kuat open until the next major CIC construction effort was complete, he needed a bit less than a year now before many warships of new classes and improved older models could be complete and send into the fray, then he might just win the war. Given the political turmoil of the Republic, or what passed for it these days, the Admiral would be content with a victory won outside the field of battle. After all, war was nothing more than continuation of politics with different tools. Speaking about politics, it was time for his weekly chat with the Confederate Council or at least the three beings who for all intents and purposes ran the Confederacy. The call from the CIS capital came in and after a few moments of computer systems separated by tens of thousands of light years shaking hands and exchanging long and complicated codes, a new window opened in front of Trench. There was Ilroth, one of the few Nemoidians that could be considered more than a stain upon the galaxy holding a data pad in one hand and a large mug of steaming beverage in the other. To his right sat the hollow image of the cyborg in charge of the Techno Union and thus Cis R and D among other things. To the overgrown toads left sat the man busy running the Confederacy's banking and overseeing the economy. He too had his nose buried into a data pad. Admiral. Ilroth grinned when he saw the connection came through. He put down his mug after taking a long sip and cheerfully waved. Our new Bothan friends managed to smuggle a lot of interesting data lately. I believe you're already briefed on the so-called Skyfall? That was a great morale boost after Bothoi for all of us. I've seen the estimates and gone over the Jedi's debriefing. The Sith survived. The cyborg rumbled. Trench focused his MKI eyes on him. It was hard to tell under the protective covering preferred by many Techno Union members, however the Admiral was rather sure that there was even less flesh and more cybernetics under the hood compared to the previous week. Despite that failure, our Bothan friends and Jedi allies did well at Kuat. Estimated loss of infrastructure and industry significantly decreases the odds of enemy victory in the long term. Cleo Vombra continued. No one mentioned that such was the case when the Confederacy lost a very big chunk of all industrial capacity at Sullust, in the short to medium term the disruption could be handled better than in the long run. Still, if the war stretched beyond two to three more years their odds of anyone achieving ultimate victory would be slim to none bearing some unforeseen disaster. At least in that the Confederacy held an advantage, with the loss of Camino, the Republic lost their source of expendable troops and soon, very soon the pampered people of the Corps would have to shed oceans of blood on the front lines. Once that happened, it would be a race between the Republic somehow winning or at least forcing terms upon the Confederacy and political and economic implosion. So far the economy is looking rather good. San Hill looked up from the data pad he was reading from. Our best estimates are that we'll be able to keep going at full war footing for years to come as long as we can keep our core territories safe. Incorporation of Bothan colonies and various other Republic breakaway systems has been very good for the Treasury even though many of them lacked significant heavy industry. Bothoi itself is a mixed bag. Whatever Vale did to the planet itself made it a lost cause. Sending organics down there makes them sick in a short order no matter what shielding and protective suits we employ. The cyborg let out an electronic sound of exasperation and frustration. Even droids don't last long enough to make trying to salvage anything worth it. 
Fortunately, the effect has been significantly reduced in orbit and most of the infrastructure there is salvageable. We're almost done towing it to the other planets in system. Another electronic whine came from Vombra. The ships from the Bothan home fleet that lost their crews still cause random malfunction on droids serving as new crews and make organics sick after spending more than a few days on board. We're running all kinds of experiments on them to determine the cause. He paused. We're requesting the aid of our Jedi allies. The cyborg definitely sounded pained at that admission. I'll relay your request. It wasn't like Perion was in a state to be on the front lines any time soon after Vale nearly murdered him on Kuat. Given his own necessary cybernetics, Trench could be sympathetic toward what happened to that human, his lower jaw ended up with the bones practically liquefied that led its complete removal and there were shock-related cracks all over his skull and upper part of his spine. The Admiral would never know how the human didn't end either paralyzed or brain-dead. The only answer anyone had on how Perion not only survived but was slowly recovering was the force and for obvious reasons that gave Trench the creeps. What did it take to kill someone like their ally or the Sith leading the Republic? From all accounts, Perion had all but killed that Zash woman at Kuat, kicked Vale's ass too, yet both of those were obviously alive and all over the news at Coruscant over the past week. As if reading the Admiral's thoughts, Ilroth took another sip of his drink and grimaced. We've moved as much of our strategic reserve as we could afford for the operation at Mandalore. It's all droid run so Vale couldn't liquefy the brain of another of our best admirals. He nodded at Trench. I hope that TK-51 can rid us of that particular Sith at least. As our plans require, the rest of the reserve is in place to either aid holding the core or at least cover your fighting retreat and further bleed the Republic Navy as they retake the core, Trench nodded. It was nice to have another confirmation that he had the trust and backing of his new and what was left of the old political leadership. How does the new construction programs go? The Admiral inquired. On schedule. Vombra's answer was short and to the point. We've completed the shift in munificent production, now they take only 25% of our overall capacity and the MK3 model has been engineered from the ground up as escort with some teeth. We've discontinued production of the B1, series of droids as combat platforms and are now relying on them merely as crews and in a pinch, laborers. We're running just a few production lines for new units and spare parts. The rest of our ground forces would consist of B2 MK2 and MK3 supper battle droids as the backbone, augmented by as much commando units we can build with the manufacturing lines and factories repurposed from the B1 construction. Various heavier and specialized units will act as power multipliers, we're still testing what works in that regard. Mandalore has turned to be a great test bed. Ilroth grinned at the irony of using the Mandalorians in that way. After all, the whole clone army was modeled after one of their best and trained by them. As if not more important, all those new volunteer units being trained in Republic space would inevitably be a few steps down from either the Mandalorians themselves or the clone armies. Anything that worked against the later would be more than enough to face if not crush the former. New and upgraded tank and IFE models are making very good showing. I'm in fact upgrading the Trade Federation organic forces with that new gear. Ilroth confided something that was a public secret nowadays. I'm more interested in the naval situation. It doesn't matter how many droids, tanks and or any other ground unit our factories can build if we lack the ships to deploy them to the front and keep them supplied. This war will be won or lost in space. Anything else would merely slow down the enemy and make their victory more painful. Trench warned. You're correct. Vombra made an additional sound of agreement to underline his words. Another 25% of construction capacity goes for recusant light destroyers MK2 with improved droid brains, umbrella systems and general weapon coverage. The MK2B variant is larger and can serve as a carrier for ground forces and the newer vulture models as bombers and air superiority fighters. The other 50% already go for dedicated capital ship construction. Now that was a good news. That transition was still underway during the meeting last week. Correct. 
We are keeping 25% for various Lucrehuk battleship variants, they're good enough for both frontline services, dual purpose troop transport, and in a pinch, heavy armed and protected logistics vessels. The downside was that they consumed hypermatter at a prodigious pace, however, with multiple new refueling stations established or captured from the enemy, along with new refineries for that precious resource, the CIS forces in the core were now well supplied. Besides, it was thanks to a few hundred Lucrehuk battleships that Trench managed to fortify Corellia and the other hubs on along the major hyper lanes now controlled by the CIS to the extent he was more or less comfortable with facing everything the enemy could now throw in his face. 15% go for the Providence MK2 which meant an incorporated umbrella into the design, less hangar space, better armor and weapon coverage as well. The remaining shipbuilding capacity is divided between the Subjugator Project and Bulwark Project. We're experimenting with a possible answer for the enemy silencer. The almost ready devastation is being completed at the Pamant docks where we have laid her three sister ships. She has prototype iron pulse cannons using captured force crystals as focus. We got those during one of the last operations ordered by Count Dooku before his removal from power. Preliminary tests show promise. Good. Time until completion? Two months. Three until she'll be fully ready for service barring unexpected complications with the prototype systems. The cyborg allowed a hind of pride in his modulated voice. We have another three of them being billed at Fondor along with a third of the bulwark MK2 battlecruisers. The original production run at Furost is being upgraded during construction with the umbrella system and the delay was deemed acceptable. We already have A the first operational squadron being under extensive trials and as agreed, we won't deploy them in action unless we have a full fleet assembled or the enemy strikes Furost in force. The other locations building those ships, like Fondor, are beyond the enemy's reach for the time being. At this time a third of the Bulwark MK2s are being billed at Furost, with another third at Fondor and the rest spread throughout the various shipyards deep in friendly space. We're currently experimenting with various new classes as well but won't commence any major efforts until and unless their prototypes show enough capacity to justify an industrial shift to their models and increased logistics burden. Those are good news and a very nice update on how the new shipbuilding programs were going. Do we have further news and better analysis on the purpose and potential effects of the Coruscant summit? Trench changed the topic to the political side of the meeting. We're getting some mixed signals. Initially our agents and analysts were almost sure that the Skyfall would finally shatter the Republic and handle us the victory. Ilroth grumbled, this morning's announcement during the ball in the Senate sent a very different message. Reforging the Republic, in the Sith's and Mandalorian's image no doubt. Trench snorted. He was sure that if Perian wasn't in medically induced coma after the operations to fix him, he would be up the wall after said announcement by the Chancellor. The Jedi from the old Republic and high-ranking military personnel he had to deal with or heard of over the past few hours were little better. The same could be said about the few Jedi who were captured or decided to defect after their failed coup and Order 66. At least they were primarily Perian's headache or at least were until he left for Kuat and returned jawless. Now they were one more headache for Trench to manage. It was too bad that the Jedi's coup failed. The banker grumbled. If they had been able to remove the Sith a piece might have been possible. Now? San Hill lowered his large head. We need to win or we're all headed for the chopping block for betraying the Sith. They did betray us all in the first place. Ilroth pointed out. It's not like they would care. Vombra added after a piercing electronic snort. It's victory or death for all of us. Even more now that the Sith reinforced their grip through this summit. Do any of you hold any illusions about what it means now that they managed to keep things together? He asked rhetorically. Our analysts agree, the Sith successfully made the deals they needed to build their empire. On the bright side, we're the good guys now, Ilroth chuckled. Fighting against Sith and Mandalorian tyranny and to keep freedom alive in the galaxy. No one needed to add that the Confederacy Council had no intentions of leaving many if any important decisions to the Confederate Senate, 
especially now that all had seen what democracy without strong and firm leadership could lead to. If it wasn't for the cis military reaching its logistic limits, the chaos on Coruscant following Palpatine's assassination might have allowed them a successful knockout blow against the Republic. They would never allow such a problem to arise within the Confederacy on their watch. At least until the war was won for good. The Confederate Council knew very well that they either hung together or the Sith were going to murder them one by one until they were all gone. Speaking about good publicity and causing our Republic friends some issues, in a few days we'll have the Senate vote in on the Confederacy Constitution and we foresee a few snags among certain of our members. Ilroth grew serious. The type that would require military intervention? Yes. Ilroth nodded firmly. We're giving you a heads up now, we made the decision just a few minutes ago after digesting the latest events on Coruscant. We are eradicating slavery within the Confederacy's borders, however pledging not to intervene in the internal workings of outside powers as long as they are courteous enough to do the same. Shadowfeed will lap it up. Trench nodded. Along with many citizens in both the Republic, the Confederacy and nominally neutral space, like the Huts, Happens and Systems that recently seceded from the Republic. It would be a PR coup that would further strengthen support for the Confederacy and infuriate certain members that practiced slavery. I'll make the necessary arrangements. Rose? Secure the systems in question, pacify unruly locals, liberate the slaves and those who we need, make sure that they get decent treatment and get paid. We have enough freebie 1s to replace unskilled or lowly skilled slave labor and those with useful skills we have the money to pay. Those who we need but refuse to play ball after being liberated, well it sucks to be them. Ilroth shrugged. I see. Trench nodded and actually smiled. The council played the long game and planned for a future where the Confederacy would be either victorious or force the Republic to accept terms that left it a viable state under more or less the current political leadership. This particular part of the Constitution would more or less cement said leadership in the eyes of the common citizens.